All right, it's starting soon. Okay, go. You're good. All right. Yeah. Okay. Well, welcome, everybody. We're happy to have you come to our tech talk today, and we're excited. Hello. We're happy to have everybody here, and it uh, looks like we have a fairly full house today of students and outside guests, but we're very, very pleased to have Nate Taggart here, and uh, excited to have you talk, and, and uh, we'll let you go to it. Thanks Thank a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm Nate Taggart. I'm the CEO of Stackery. We're a Portland-based company. We build a serverless operations console. And today I wanted to talk about serverless, which is uh, also called FAST, functions as a service, and uh, the kind of modern emerging developer practices for this technology. Um, so if uh, FAST or serverless, if this is a new thing that you haven't heard of, uh, you're in luck. It's, it is new. Not a lot of people have heard of it. Um, and in fact, for people who are starting their computer science programming careers, uh, serverless is, is possibly a really good entry point because it um, abstracts away some of the kind of tedious work we used to have to do as engineers. Um, and also, nobody has any experience in this domain yet. <laughs> so you're, you're, you're already uh, at, the, at the bleeding edge. Um, at a very high level, uh, serverless is this idea, there are servers, I'll, I'll start there, there are servers. Uh, serverless is this idea that we write code, we think of code in terms of an application or an individual function, we give it to a cloud provider like AWS or Microsoft Azure, and we tell them when to run it. So we, we set it to an event, and that could be something like an API call or you know once an hour or, or some trigger, and we say, when this event happens, run my code. The cool thing about this is that you only pay for the server or for the compute time when your code is run. So if you build an application, say you build an API, and nobody uses it, it was free. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> you only wasted time. Um, but if, in fact, it becomes really popular and people use it, um, serverless automatically scales up and down to handle that traffic. So you don't have to manage the physical servers or the infrastructure. You also don't have to uh, deploy servers, install software onto servers, patch them for security vulnerabilities, balance traffic between them, or do any of the kind of operations workload around orchestrating the infrastructure itself. So some kind of cool advantages. Um, and maybe there are also some disadvantages. So one of the challenges with serverless is that it's, it's a new kind of approach to this kind of software engineering which means that there are not a ton of resources today to ramp up really quickly. So there aren't hundreds of blogs dedicated to serverless. There aren't thousands of experts on Stack Overflow answering questions right away. It's very cutting edge. It's, um, there's a lot of ambiguity still in how serverless will best be used and kind of what patterns are gonna emerge. But what we're seeing in the market today is that a lot of companies, particularly big enterprise companies, are moving their operations to serverless technology. They're doing it right now, and so there's a lot of, I think, emerging opportunity to, to plug into serverless. And the reason that they're making this transition is because if you're, you know, say Google or Twitter, you might actually have a big competitive advantage in building the talent in-house to run these massive data centers. That may be valuable for you. But if you're any other company, it's probably not a very valuable skill to develop in-house. It's not valuable to spend a lot of time training people or recruiting people to run a data center, which Amazon can do for you really, really well. And so what we find is that a lot of these kind of operations challenges of like, how do we, um, deploy servers, keep them healthy, make sure that they're secure and patched, that our code runs on them consistently, that we balance traffic across them, that they're available geographically in, in all kinds of availability zones. These, these um, tasks don't add a lot of business value for the companies, and so they don't want to invest in that. Instead, what they want to invest in is writing software. And I know there's a lot of different reasons to get into computer science, but I got involved to write software. I didn't actually want to patch 
uh, security vulnerabilities on a server. That was not the highlight that brought me in. Uh, and because of that, serverless, I think, is a really cool um, opportunity to not only uh, work on some cool cutting edge technology, but also I think there's, there's a lot of um, career promise in this field right now. So uh, that kind of sets the stage. Ho hopefully we all have a shared understanding of serverless now. And what I wanted to talk about is how the role of a developer today is changing because of this new technology. Um, so I've been working in software for about 15 years now, and over that time I've seen a lot of emerging kind of changes, some big changes in the industry that were driven by technology. So one of the big changes that I saw in the last 15 years was a move to have more software running uh, client side in the browser. So think about like JavaScript applications, like React applications or Angular applications. Um, that was a big shift that really happened, you know, maybe 10 years ago is when it, I think, kind of kind of landed. Um, and that changed a lot of the ways that developers worked. Um, tools that you, you might have to debug your application. So think about being able to um, pull server logs out of your application. Those tools suddenly stopped working if you had a client-side application running in somebody's browser. It also introduced a bunch of new technical problems like, for example, you don't know what operating system that person is going to be running or what browser they're going to be using. And so you have to do a lot more testing of kind of different conditions and figuring out what's working. Really similar changes happening today with serverless in that you no longer control the environment that your application is running in. You don't get to SSH in and pull out security logs or, or server logs. Um, you don't get to install software on the server or be able to collect any kind of data like um, the, about the environment. And what that means is that the role of a developer is once again changing. So we have to start thinking about how we run these applications while we're building them. So let me give you an example. Uh, because you can't SSH into the server because you don't own the server, Amazon owns the server, and you can't get access to those logs, if you need to get log data, you have to get it out while your application is running, like in real time. So you have to collect diagnostic data in advance of there being any problems that you'd have to troubleshoot or debug. What this means is that developers are now being more and more responsible for some of what was traditionally more of like an operations role. You used to have developers write software and then they'd give it to an operations team to like release it, ship it, run it, maintain the health of it. Developers are starting to take on both of those responsibilities. So some of the challenges that um, you know might not be uh, typical, you know, traditional developer roles like um, maintaining the health of the application, um, monitoring performance and throughput, um, uh, watching for things like errors, error rates in your application. These are responsibilities which I think today in a lot of modern organizations developers are responsible for, but 10 years ago they weren't. And so a lot of you know the kind of the classic thinking around right software is one process and run software is another process. That thinking is is changing right now. Um, serverless requires this like premeditated approach to not only how do you write the software, but then how do you run it and keep it healthy over time. And we've outsourced some of the work, so work like um, availability and scaling, um, security patching, some of that that's outsourced, but some of the work like, um, you know, like troubleshooting an error, for example, that's, that's something that a developer has to think about while you're writing your software if there was an error in the software, how would I know about it? What data would I have to then fix it? And like, what kind of visibility would I have in that software? So uh, Stackery, my company, is building tooling for this new technology, for serverless, that um, handles some of the niceties around that. So for example, if you deploy a serverless function with Stackery, you automatically wrap it in a try-catch loop so that if it throws an error, any kind of unexpected exception happens, 
we can grab the diagnostic details. We can take that error object and return it to the developer before that serverless function dies off. Um, so it's nice if you have some tooling around it to help you do some of this. But it also requires that developers are being a little bit more proactive in thinking about what kind of diagnostic information do I need to be able to get out of my application at runtime. And the, this becomes part of the planning process of writing a software. So I know there's a lot there that we're digging into. <laughs> um, but I want to circle back and kind of talk about why some of these these shifts matter and why you might want to be thinking about it. Um, I had a really good conversation with with Eric uh, right before this, and we were talking about what makes a good software engineer. Um, I've gone pretty far in my career. I was uh, an early employee at New Relic, um, who's in town, big, big software engineering shop. Um, and then immediately before this current job, I was running the data science program at GitHub. So a lot of you know, fun work, very challenging, kind of cutting edge engineering work that I've been doing. And, uh, and I've been working with incredibly talented engineers. And the one thing that I consistently have found that these great engineers do, which is a skill that's not native to me and I had to like work to develop, was to really um, embrace some of the ambiguity and some of the unknown. You hear about a new technology and you don't know anything about it and so or I at least I hear a new technology I don't know anything about it and so my first instinct is to say oh I, I'm not the guy for that I don't, I don't know this stuff. Um, when these new technologies emerge though like serverless what I found is these are the moments in my career that have really been impactful where if instead of saying like I don't know anything about this I say none of you know anything about this so <laughs> I, ha I might as well learn it myself. Um, those have been those have been really um, great moments in my career that like leveled me up and got me to kind of the next stage, and so I want to introduce serverless not just as a new technology and not just as you know something to to play around with, but as potentially a career trajectory changing um, opportunity. Um, one of the challenges with um, working on, on kind of the cutting edge this ambiguity, is that there aren't a lot of resources. There aren't a lot of people to ask for help for. Um, you know, personally, I, I, I was self-taught. I did not, there were not code schools when I started learning software. And um, so I spent a lot of time like reading blogs or, you know, going to, uh, this was, there were forums back then, bulletin boards, and asking questions and waiting, waiting and waiting and waiting for someone to answer one of those questions. Um, today, you can get, I think you can get that help um, a lot quicker, and I think that helps people ramp up on software very quickly, which is great. But only if you're doing something that's fairly mainstream and that's pretty broadly done. So if you want to get help on like how to build a, you know, an application with jQuery, there's a decade of blogs on that topic. But if you want to you know, do something with, say, machine learning, it's a fairly cutting edge field. There's not there's not a decade of experience here, right? This is um, this is new stuff, and so I think it, it represents an opportunity to um, really dig in and, and embrace the fact that uh, that nobody knows this. You're not at a disadvantage. There's a really cool, compelling opportunity here uh, to become an expert in a in a field. So. Um, Again, I, I'll circle back and say I think serverless presents a really good opportunity for that. And if anybody is looking for like um, you know serverless resources or has questions about how to do serverless, all of the engineers at my company love to help and love to talk about that. So um, feel free to ask Eric for an introduction to me and my team, and we'd be we'd be glad to dig in with you. Um, but I'll I'll close there and and turn it over and into a discussion and hopefully be able to answer some questions. Yeah. So you mentioned that there are like a, a bunch of the traditional resources when something is cutting edge. Like, do you become an expert just by <coughs> messing with it and like <laughs> and just trying stuff out and I love and tearing that. it apart? Yeah, or? I love that. And the answer is absolutely. Okay. Um, you know, a lot of different kind of related um, ideas or experiences will help some people get find little shortcuts to become good at some new technology, right? But the reality is um, 
like serverless uh, is backed by these, these function as a service products that are released by Amazon and Microsoft, like I mentioned. Uh, Amazon's product is the, is the most mature, and it released three years ago. Really didn't start getting any significant traction, I would say, until a, a year or two ago. Um, Azure's product is even less old. So the people who have been using it the absolute longest, like the very the people who are speaking at conferences and are the, the worldwide experts, they have like eighteen months of experience with this technology. Right? So you're not you're not really behind. I'm not really behind. It's you know it's a it's a good, um, but you're right. And like, how do you get that? How do you get that experience? You experiment. And I think what I've seen is there's there's two patterns that developers have for um, kind of what draws them into. Well, there's money. The money draws me into it. <coughs> but there's two other, uh, I think, motivators. One is building things. If you like to create you know, something from nothing, that's a really powerful driver to do engineering. And the other is uh, puzzles, or like solving things. You know? um, and I think that in particular, that motivation to like take something that you don't have the answer for and keep you know, toying with it until you get the answer, um, that will help you explore a new technology and, and essentially invent, invent new solutions in the technology. Yeah? Um, I've heard of uh, software as a service. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the difference between the two and maybe uh, talk about a few examples of uh, avenues? <coughs> I'm sorry, I missed the very last part of the question. Yeah. Uh, can you uh, give a couple of examples of API processes? Under this, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm supposed to re-ask the question. So the uh, question was, uh, what's the difference between uh, software as a service and functions as a service? And what are some examples of like an API, maybe use case around functions as a service? Is that right? Cool. Um, so uh, software as a service is really just a licensing model. That's really all it is. Um, and I don't think it's very similar to functions as a service, except in name, and I kind of hate that, honestly. <laughs> but um, so, you know, software as a service is the idea that um, you subscribe to software, and uh, over time it should theoretically keep getting better, and you keep paying your monthly fee, and you get to use it. Function as a service is, um, is more of a, a delivery model for the way infrastructure can be consumed. So by infrastructure, I mean really servers underneath the covers. But the old way that we would do it is we would buy servers. Um, we, when I started in software, my company had a closet that we put servers in. And I was like, that was normal. That was the normal way to do it. Um, so we'd buy these servers. They're like $5,000, $10,000. We'd order them. And then there was like always, they were always back ordered. So we'd wait like a month until the server came. And then when it came, we'd, we'd plug, like somebody's job would be to plug it in and set it up. And periodically, someone would have to go and like reset it, like physically press buttons and reset the server. Um, and we thought we were fancy. Like that was the best we had. Um, and then AWS came out, you know, ballpark a decade ago. And um, slowly, it didn't happen overnight, but slowly the industry has moved to, the idea that buying a server is insane, um, and you can spin one up in, two minutes on Amazon. Um, and now you can still, you know, press the reset button, but you use your keyboard and you do it remotely and, and it's a lot easier. Um, so you can get servers faster, you can get servers cheaper, and the administration is kind of abstracted away, but you can still do all the things you need to do. Functions as a service is one more level of abstraction. So you don't even have to turn the server on. It will automatically, you know, be ready when it's needed based on these events that we're going to set it up to, like an API endpoint. You also don't have to rent it by the hour anymore. You can rent it down to like a tenth of a second. It's like while your code's actually running. So it gets a lot cheaper. Um, and again, another level of abstraction. You don't have to do any of the like reset it or you know, turn it on, turn it off, manage your usage. This orchestration part goes away. Um, at least it goes away for you. Amazon still has to do all that, right? Um, and then in terms of use case for APIs, um, it's, it's, it's actually really pretty flexible. So the idea would be, um, let me give you a, a really common one we're seeing a lot of, uh, which is Internet of Things. 
Um, one of the big users of serverless technology is a company called iRobot. They make Roombas, right? They have a million robots, and those robots all periodically need to phone home. And the problem is, if all million robots phone home at the same time, they need a lot of server capacity. So they would have to rent, you know, dozens of servers to just always be ready for a million robots to phone home. But a lot of the time, they're not all connecting, right? The, the robots don't run all the time. They just turn on and turn off. And so what they use is they have an API endpoint, which is a URL path, right? And whenever one of the robots goes to that, it spins up one of these functions as a service behind the scene to run that code right away. And that means that if a million do that at once, then that code will get spun up a million times to all happen at the same time. But if only one robot does it, or if no robots do it, then it, it also scales down very well to you. And so um, one of the big use cases for serverless to, as an API backend is what we call like bursty traffic or unpredictable traffic. If you don't know how much load you're going to get on your system, it's very difficult to try to provision the right amount of servers efficiently. And so the solution is either over-provision, so you never you know, run out of capacity, but you're overpaying, or under-provision, which means that you might be saving some money, but periodically have an outage. Um, serverless means you don't have to make that choice anymore. Does that address your question? Sort of Please go. So the um, the serverless products are actually offered by the cloud providers. So like Amazon, for example, has about 100 different services that you can go, AWS, that you can go buy. I and mean, you can buy them all individually and in different increments. So for example, you can rent servers from them by the hour. You can do that. Um, that service is called EC2. And you could alternatively, you could go rent like a database service from them. They call that RDS. And they, they just have you know all these different pieces. And you can think about it in kind of like a catalog. Like you just plug in all the pieces that you want and assemble your system, right? Um, some of the pieces that they offer actually compete internally with some of their others. So for example, you can have like a relational database. RDS is the relational database service. Or you could use a non-relational database, um, like an object store type, type solution. They have one called Dynamo. Um, so in this way, like even Amazon will sometimes <laughs> offer these different products that like you get to pick between to figure out like what's right for your solution. For some jobs, renting that server by the hour is going to actually be the right solution for the customer, and the customer you, know, you can still do that. You buy their EC2 service, or you might use their serverless uh, solution, which is called Lambda AWS Lambda. And with Lambda, you just you just pay for as it as it runs when it runs on demand. One of, the, one of the things that I love about Lambda, and actually one of the reasons I got into like playing with this technology, was because it's, it can be really cheap. Um, even a small server, you still might be paying 10 or $20 a month to run it, a very, you know, a very small server, okay? uh, just to have it running all the time. And you can turn it on and turn it off, of course, and save a little bit of money, but then you have to manage that. Um, Lambda, you only are actually paying when it runs. So you might run, you know, a very small level of traffic through that service and pay eight cents this month or whatever it is. So, yeah. So I'm a developer. Great. I've been so many people here as developers. I know when I'm writing code, I know yeah. what a function looks like. Sure, yeah. And I know, you know the parts of my code, how to call that function. Sure, yeah. With function as a service, what do I see? What do I do mm -hmm. to make a Lambda thing in AWS? And how does my code know to talk to that Lambda thing? Yeah. What, 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 what changes for me? Yeah. So there are actually two approaches here. Um, Don't forget your secret. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the question is, uh, 
you know, as a developer, I know what a function is, and I know how to have one function call another function. How do I um, replicate that behavior in a serverless uh, service? Is that right? Yes. Um, and my answer is there are two answers. Um, one answer is that we're overloading the word function. And I think this is really dangerous. And I'm not picking the jargon. Um, but when I talk about function as a service, I absolutely expect that you hear that as a discrete piece of code, a function. Um, but it doesn't have to be that. You can actually take a full application and slot that in as your function. Right. So what a function really is, is a, an event to trigger code. So some entry point in your code. And then whatever amount of code you want, give or take, there's some constraints, but generally speaking, which will then you know, create a return, or maybe it doesn't even return. You know, it just does something. Um, so one, one way to answer this is you build it exactly the same. There are no changes. All you're doing is defining what triggers it. So um, if you went onto AWS and said, I want to use Lambda, you could, I don't recommend this, but you could copy and paste your code in and select an event to trigger it and hit submit. And that's a deployment. You're up and running. Uh, the, the other answer is um, that Amazon doesn't make it very easy to string together multiple functions. And in fact, there's some argument about whether or not you should string together multiple functions. Um, and that's one of the reasons that my company exists. We actually let you diagram it like a Visio diagram, where you say like, this API endpoint is gonna call this function, which is gonna call this database, chain them together, and then hit deploy. Um, we build out that template in Amazon's templating language uh, so that um, we implement your design. Um, but one of the interesting questions about that is how does this change design patterns for applications, this new technology? So if you're paying while your code is running, then you really don't ever want your code waiting for something. Like waiting is just idle time that you're now paying for. So if you think about a chain of functions where function A calls function B and function A waits for function B to do something, now you're paying for two instances instead of just paying for one instance. Where if you could put those two pieces of code together into one bigger function, right? Then that one function is just always running and active and returns quick, quickly. So this is where I, I would argue nobody has good answers today. Like this is, in my mind, this is the, um, the opportunity for us as developers is to say, what is the right approach to this? How should we design applications with this new technology? Um, and it does help to have some experience in other design systems. But at the end of the day, I think um, we're all trying to figure this out still. Yeah, yeah please. All right, so when you're deploying uh, new software on Amazon servers, mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming it's not deploying on one server and it's on that server waiting. It's your code's on probably multiple servers yeah. and waiting. Somewhere because yeah. I don't think you could just like keep your code in one spot and like have it have it always be ready. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really great point. So um, uh, you're getting into some of the um, implementation details of the service, and this is really cool. So first off, you don't have to worry about that, but I still think you should. But like one of the benefits of the service is that that's Amazon's job to deal with. That said, there are some actual implementation details that will impact. Um, so, behind the scenes, Amazon has a job, a pretty difficult computer science job called bin packing that they have to solve. And bin packing is, how do we distribute the different jobs um, in such a way that they're always available on a number of systems, right? Um, without overloading any given system. Um, so, for example, if your function gets called a million times, how many servers does it need to be on for it to always have available capacity, right? And as it spins up on some servers, what um, implications does that have for how many more it should be provisioned onto in advance of it actually needing to be? And then how do you keep it always ready? So the, um, Amazon uses a caching technique 
Um, and the way that it works is that the very first time your function is called, um, particularly if it hasn't been called in a long time or ever, that very first time it will do what's called a cold boot, which means it will take a little bit, it, they will load it mm -hmm. and then turn it on, right? Um, and so that first boot up could take about two seconds so if you're thinking about like a customer facing application, adding two seconds of latency could actually be problematic, right? But once it's up and has run once, they'll keep it cached, which means they'll have it in memory instead of have to spin it off, off a disk and be able to run it much, much quicker. So like the next time it might only have 50 milliseconds of latency or something. But that cold boot issue can actually happen on every single server that it's provisioned on. So if you have, um, <coughs> you know, really kind of periodic traffic, cold boot could be a, a engineering problem you'd have to <coughs> find a workaround for. Um, with, uh, I will say, Amazon has a reputation, and this is true for Azure or whoever, but Amazon has a reputation of releasing a product and then improving the product over time, particularly when they get popular, and this one's getting popular. So it would not be surprising to me if they made it so that you know, cold boots were less of an issue down the road or something. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Uh, so you yeah. said scaling um, yeah. is done automatically basically for you. Um, I guess like from Amazon's end, like do they like do you give them an estimate of like how much you think your function is going to be called? You don't. You don't. So it's crazy, just, right? I'm more confused about Amazon of how they scale it. How they do it? Yeah. Yeah, so um, they, uh, I'm trying to think of what they publicly disclose. We have an NDA with them, so like, I gotta be careful. Oh. Um, I, I believe that they look at a number of attributes about your account and about other functions that you've released in your account. Um, they also put, by default, they put certain constraints on any individual account, and you can raise those so think of it as like limits. You can raise those limits if you work with Amazon to raise them. But by default, um, I think they'll give you like, you know, a thousand function calls at the, at the same time, concurrent calls as like a limit. Um, you, can, you can go higher than that, I think, if you call Amazon and like talk to them and tell them what you need. Uh, but I think they, they do put some limits on, I actually think the, the limits are for your benefit because if you, say you create a loop where one function calls a function that calls the first function again, you could get into a scenario where you're like triggering millions of unnecessary function calls. Um, Amazon doesn't want you to cut yourself like that. And so they do put some of these little limits in place like recursion depth, concurrency, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, if you wanted to like roll this yourself, uh, like say host your own server with a function as a service, uh, service, function as a service, service, how would you do that? Um, there are actually some open source projects that are emerging for um, companies who want to host their own VAS layer. Um, and the way to think about this is really as an, as an orchestration layer. So orchestration is just when do we turn things on, when do we turn them off, kind of managing jobs, right? Um, and it's doing that automatically. You could have a human that sat there and like turn the servers on and off. Um, one of them is called OpenFast. You can check that out. And then there are ones called Fission and Function. Function is with a K. Uh, and, and each of those are projects that um, are essentially that orchestration layer that Amazon's doing or that Microsoft Azure is doing, but that you could run yourself on your own server or in your own infrastructure. Um, it does introduce some challenges, so like these bin packing problems, for example, become problems that you have to deal with now in your own infrastructure. And um, Amazon has completely abstracted the servers away, but you do have to run that you know fast layer on a server or on a server cluster now. So somebody in your team still has to manage a server, even though it might not be every developer. So some different things to think about. Yeah, please. 
Oh, that's a really great question. Yeah, so there are two questions. One is, uh, my company strategy, are we kind of selling the vision of serverless, or are we waiting for people to, to choose it and call us? And number two, um, how much work is it for companies to migrate to this technology? Is that fair? Um, so I'll answer the first question, which is, uh, we don't try to convince companies to pick serverless. Um, and that's mostly because we don't have to. Um, there's a lot of interest in serverless because it solves some very big problems. If you're spending a million dollars a month on your IT infrastructure, and say, you know, 80% of that is just idle capacity that you have in case you get a traffic spike, the, the idea that you could uh, only pay for what you literally use and cut your costs by half a million dollars a month or something, like, that's attractive on its face to just about any company. Um, and on the other side, so that's the cost, you know, the business side of it, and then there's the operation side of it, which is, I'd rather have my team building the product and adding value to my customers than I would have them patching servers and, you know, doing things like this. Um, and so there's this, also, there's this, like, product velocity value that's driving companies to serverless. On the other hand, there are blockers that are keeping them from doing serverless. So um, no professional software company is going to release software that's not automated, that the release process is not automated. Nobody's sitting there pressing buttons step by step because it's too prone to errors and they can't afford a big average. You, know, you could imagine like um, you know, Nike Nike.com is not getting deployed by somebody sitting there like pressing next or whatever. Um, they need this automation, and so it's very difficult for them to embrace some new technologies sometimes until that tooling emerges around it to give them automation, error monitoring, uh, performance visibility, stuff like this. Right? Um, so in a lot of ways, uh, we do let them kind of reach out to us. And we, we're proactive about it. We know who's using serverless, and so we'll approach them. But um, not in the sense that we're approaching them to convince them to do serverless or let us teach you how to do it. Much more in the sense that we know you want to do serverless, and you're missing these pieces in order to do it well. Uh, and we have those pieces. Yeah. Uh, and then the other question, which I think is a really great question, uh, how are companies making this migration? Do they have to rebuild it? Um, the, the frank answer is they have to rebuild stuff, like a, a lot of stuff. Um, do they have to rebuild everything? Not quite, but close enough that like, yeah. Um, so containers, which I'd say was the last major infrastructure kind of technology shift. Um, you think of like Docker containers. With a Docker container, you could take your application and basically package it up in this container. And then these containers become portable. You can move them from one server to another to deploy them. And that had what we would call a lift and shift model, where you can literally take your application and move it, right? Um, serverless, you're designing it for this architecture. Right? You have to um, you know, make a a function that can be triggered by a specific event to, to do this, right? Uh, and so in a lot of ways, you have to kind of reimagine how to build these services. Um, like this example that we were talking about earlier, where you have one function calling another function calling another function, like actually coming at that and thinking about what's the most cost-effective way to build this and run this um, becomes part of the development cycle. So it does require some development. Um, one of the trends that we found, though, is that companies are, um, they have been for a while, but a lot of companies are still transitioning from what we call monolithic applications to microservices. So you, you can think of, um, when I was at New Relic, we were doing this. New Relic was run on a giant Ruby on Rails application. One application that did every single part of the company. Um, and that's really bad for a lot of reasons, but the reason that it was worse is because if you're a new employee, you have to learn everything before you can do anything. Anything you change can impact everything else. It's not very well encapsulated. 
And so one of the projects that we had was to start to split that up into individual services. So, you know, maybe you just have to learn how does the authentication system work? And that's it. And it's kind of self-contained and it has an API that interfaces with the rest of the application. So a lot of companies are right now doing that migration still, that like transition to microservices. And serverless fits into that pattern very, very well. You have this big application and we're gonna take just the email system and run it on serverless. Right? And because we're breaking it out and having to rebuild that anyway, it doesn't really matter that we have to change it for serverless because we were gonna rebuild it. Yeah, please. Okay, so I'm trying to absorb these ideas of my <laughs> tiny brain. And um, I get the idea of big web application monolith does everything. Yeah. I think I get the idea of a microservice, which is a web service that is not an entire app. Something small. So, is function as a service is that is that just a small web service that's triggerable? Could yeah, that's a great way to think is of that, it. Maybe is that the idea here. So the the question is is a uh, function as a service just like a small uh, microservice web service that's callable? Um, and my answer is yes. I think that's a great way to think about it. Um, you might think of it as like a micro microservice. Could even be a component of a microservice, right? So uh, think about, uh, let's say you have a, a service that's like um, authentication. We all know how authentication works, at least in theory. I don't, but you log in, you log out, you pass some tokens around, right? We get the idea, okay. So that's our service. Now you might have an individual function, like a fast component, right? That say um, does password verification, or that does return a login cookie, or something, some individual discrete element of the behavior. And the advantage of breaking that service down into these individual components is again, because you don't have to know how everything works very easy to drive into the right, you know, to find an entry point and to know exactly where to go to change functionality. And it creates what, you know, what could be described as like uh, atomized components, right? Any, any component by itself is self-containing, you can modify it, and it just has interfaces with the other components. Which I know sounds very abstract, but when you're thinking about, um, you know, a, a monolithic application that has literally hundreds of thousands or millions of lines of code, like the ramifications of making a change are gigantic. And onboarding onto a million line code base is a nightmare. If instead you can say, my team, what my team does is the charts. That's it, that's what we do. We do the charting service, right? And so we maintain this one service that builds charts. That's all we have to do. And that service is only 10,000 lines of code. Now I can ramp up on that in a week or two or whatever, and I can hit the ground running, I can be productive. And once I master that, I might be able to then go pick up another service and run a few of them. So, but I, all I have to know is kind of what's the perimeter of my service, and then how does my service work? Yeah. So I, I heard you say earlier that the products your company does, they kind of do some generation of uh, metadata or, or even code for, for, for some uh, yeah. service functions. I, so the, and this may be a bad example, but I was going to give you an example and see if you can kind of walk me through yeah. how it fits. So <laughs> the only serverless functionality that I'm familiar with at the moment is writing Alexa and Amazon. Yeah, Alexa totally. Skills. That's how I got started. Right. So uh, they, they again, their the event isn't an incoming API call, but it's, it's an incoming voice request that triggers your named thing and then runs your function, right? So what, what are the, some of the benefits that your product family brings to that kind of environment? So I know you, there's a lot you can do on the back end for that, right? You can call another web service, you can talk to a database. Yeah, how, absolutely. Yeah. So the question is, um, in the context of like building an Alexa application, how would my company improve that process? Yeah. So um, I'll caveat this with, that's not really like, uh, we're selling to, you know, giant yeah, enterprises, just an and example yeah, to but, walk through but yeah, just to kind of, yeah. to frame it. Um, so uh, if you've built an Alexa app, you're probably familiar with um, 
this really terrible console that you have with AWS. Um, it's all like form fields. And so you, um, for example, you'll write uh, your code in your IDE, hopefully, and then you select it, copy it, go over to the console, paste it into a form field, and hit like update, and then you wait because Amazon's slow. And then um, if you want to use dependencies, like any libraries in your, in your application, uh, then you have to package those all up as zips and use Amazon's S3 service, which is their object store, their bucket, uh, and you have to upload those dependencies and then make them make references to them in their code. It's just giant kind of mess. And so because people don't want to do that, then instead they like hand roll their own solution so they can have it all in one big file and use no dependencies. And then you have this app that gets like thousands of lines of code. Um, we bypass all of that. So with us, you don't use Amazon's like console at all. There's no copy paste. There's no file packaging. You write your code in your IDE. It's all backed by version control. You use GitHub, use whatever you like. Um, and you use Stackery to deploy. We automatically package up all your dependencies. We inspect your code, find your dependencies, and package them for you. Send them into your own S3 bucket behind the scenes. You don't have to do anything. Um, so you write your code just like normal. And then we write what's called a cloud formation, which is Amazon's infrastructure templating language. Um, and you can kind of think of it like a puppet in town. They do like um, infrastructure as code. So it's kind of the, the same idea. Um, and we give you a button to press that says execute. We link you directly into your AWS account to a page with a button. And you press the button and it's all deployed. But then once it's deployed, um, again back in like our product, you have these different, um, you have like kind of visibility. So we have this diagram of your application. You can click into any function and say like, what are the logs on this function? And we're collecting those for you and aggregating them. And um, the implementation detail is that function could be running on a lot of different physical servers. So we're also aggregating them back together so that like it works kind of the way you'd logically think of it. Like this piece of code, what is the logs for that code? Without having to worry about how many servers is it really running. Uh, and then we create an event stream in your account for any errors. So if there's an error in anywhere in your application, we now have an event that you can listen on to react to it. So like we commonly will, whenever there's an error in our application, we have a Lambda that will run. So we'll take out all that diagnostic information and send it to a third party error monitoring service for us. So we can just like aggregate and roll them up, figure out how many errors we had, which ones should we prioritize and work on. So does that mean you're also auto-generating auto some wrapper code as well? I, meant, I heard you say something we are, about that. Yeah. Like, we are, there's a ton, yeah, there's a ton of like behind the scenes kind of magic that we're doing. Um, uh, it sounds much more mysterious than it is. It's like our air handling is like literally, it's a try-catch. These are, these are very common patterns that are familiar to everyone. And then what happens is you extend them kind of one step at a time to take them a little bit further. So we do. We have um, native code support for every language that Amazon supports, um, which is essentially a try-catch that um, if, if uh, your code works, the try happens and there's no problem. And if your code doesn't work, it triggers our catch where our code can go in and then pull out the, the error. So basically you're, you're automating the process of capturing that data on a per-function basis, putting it in a data store that can be looked up per function, and so it's easier yeah. for a developer to go back and say, oh, it was this exactly. lambda function, it was in. And you could do that yourself. Yeah. Like, I mean, everything that we do, and this is true of every software product, everything that we do is something that you guys could do. Like, we're not doing anything impossible. Um, you could manually write a try-catch around every single function that you wrote, and create the handler to like pull the error out. So like this, this is kind of mainstream stuff. But we make it so that it's very generic solution. So anyone's code this works for. You don't have to like right. manually instrument. And every if you have multiple developers, they're all doing it, feeding it into the same storage, and it's very easy for everyone to kind of. Yeah, and the really the really typical thing that happens. Um, keep in mind, we're taking this one application, and we're not decomposing it into all these different functions. Very typical thing that happens is you miss one. It's one of them. You just forgot to do it yeah. one time, and if you know the day that it turns out that's the one with the error, 
you now have no way to figure out what that error is. So, so uh, kind of associated question is, uh, I guess, so you must have to, I mean, I know you said you had an NDA with Amazon, you mm -hmm. must have to kind of keep lockstep with them on certain changes, right? Because you're automating totally. some of this stuff. So how, how, is there a typical lag that you have with supporting something that's rolled out in Amazon? Or? Yeah, that's a really good question. Amazon, in fact, has internal lags. Okay. So what I mean by that is, um, I mentioned they have their templating language called CloudFormation. So the AWS Lambda team will release a feature, and then there will be a period of time, anywhere from a few days to several months, until the CloudFormation team supports that feature. Um, we can't support it until the CloudFormation team supports it, because again, we're just writing CloudFormation. Um, because we have an NDA with them and we know what's gonna get released, we can usually be ready to support it pretty much once they do within a day at least, you know, a day or two. You know. um, but yeah, it's absolutely, it's kind of a treadmill. Like yeah. We have to just keep up with them. And in addition, we have to build support for each of the services that they have. Um, and for some of the services they have, they have you know, a lot of flavors of that service, like Lambda, a somewhat different product depending on which language runtime you're using. Right? They're kind of distinctions between the Java solution and the Node solution. And so we have to support each of those too. Yeah, so it's that's that's the hard part of what you we're doing. You support Python, JavaScript, and uh, Java. Java and C sharp. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that's that's the um, that's the part that's a business, right? Like that's the part that's yeah, hard. That, that, yeah, yeah. That, keep, keeping on that treadmill is what keeps totally you, keeps you busy at night, right? Yeah, yeah totally. Keep you up at night. Yeah. As the CEO of a company in unknown territory, how do you figure out how to hire people to hire? Yeah, um, so hiring is my absolute favorite job. Oh. It's my favorite thing to do. Um, we actually, I think we have some advantages in this because um, because we're doing cutting edge kind of engineering work, we attract candidates who um, really embrace that ambiguity. They want to do this like undiscovered invention kind of work. They want to be thought leaders. They want to, uh, and so we tend to get a pretty high caliber candidate because the engineers who embrace ambiguity are high caliber engineers. Like that's what it takes to be a good engineer. You don't become a great engineer from doing the same thing over and over. You do it by solving hard new problems, and so. Um, so we found that, that there's kind of a synergy there. Like we tend to get really cool, cool applicants. Um, and then we also have a very strict no assholes rule. So okay. it's, we, we take really great candidates and we try to filter out the jerks. And yeah. that's, that's the whole process. <laughs> how, how big is your company? How many people do uh, We're up to seven now. Yeah. So it uh, feels like a real, I mean, that's a good engineering <laughs> team like size. Real... Yeah. I and mean, I think... Um, you know, so I, when we started, we were two, as my co-founder and I, uh, and two is a pretty small engineering team. I mean, it's not unheard of, but I think the sweet spot for an en engineering team is like six to ten people. Mm -hmm. um, so seven, like we're right in there. We got a really great core. And then you have marketing people too? We um, don't. Oh. Not yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, it's certainly, it's an important role, and we will, we will hire for it, uh, and salespeople and all the rest. Mm -hmm. Um, we get a little bit of an, an advantage in that, in that because we're engineers building a product for engineers, mm -hmm. you know, anybody on my team can hop on a call with someone and help them troubleshoot or kind of sell to them. Like we're not doing heavy handed sales. We're doing like, you know, technical solutions. Stuff we like. Stuff we like. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah, please. Uh, well, uh, Jamie and Georgia have a Jamie and Jordan. Mm -hmm. um, she asks, who is responsible for security and updates in FAAS, uh, the control of the function set? So who's responsible for updates on FAS and security on FAS? Um, so there's, mm -hmm. there's two mm -hmm. sides of security, always. Uh, there is, um, you know, like the server side of security, operating system, the language runtime, um, patching those vulnerabilities, and that falls on the cloud provider. So uh, you don't get to control what the operating system is, and they, you don't even control like which version of the runtime 
they'll tell you which one it is. Like this is, you know, node eight or whatever they're picking. Um, but you can't modify it. And so the cloud provider is responsible for that security. The other side of security though is, uh, and this is always the case, falls on the developer. So um, if you introduce vulnerabilities into your own code, then you're not secure and you have a responsibility to watch for that. Uh, and there are some um, kind of borders between the two where you have to pay attention. So Amazon, for example, gives you security roles, like roles and permissions that you can apply to these resources. If you don't apply them, uh, you can make them less secure. You can make them, for example, anyone could call this function, or you could apply a strict policy where only you can call the function. Right? Uh -huh. So a lot of times, like, the cloud provider will give you the tools, but you have to then learn them and use them. Thanks. So hearing about the overall buy-in from Azure and from AWS, um, do you think there's an incentive for them to lean towards a FOSS model where are they actually going to be getting more out of their resources when they just do a, a, a paper call kind of thing, the code runs. I mean, ultimately, do they get more from their own infrastructure if this becomes more and more adopted and more the norm? Yeah. Um, so the question is, uh, is this better for, say, Amazon or Azure to steer towards a fast model because of the efficiency of their infrastructure? Um, I would say, this is a little, I'm kind of reading between the lines of what they've said publicly. Mm -hmm. um, I would say it's a mixed bag, honestly. On the one hand, um, they don't care about the inf infrastructure efficiency. They're running a commodity business. The more they sell, the more money they make. Um, and renting a server that you don't use and renting a server that you do use doesn't matter to them. They paid for the server, they got the money, right? Uh, in fact, if anything, it's maybe a tiny bit cheaper if you don't use it because it uses less power and less mm -hmm. bandwidth. And um, That said, uh, Amazon in particular has a very clear and publicly stated goal of doing what's best for the customer. I think that helps them pretty well. You know, they've built a you know massive $100 billion business around AWS, but... Um, I don't think that they're doing, they're looking at it in terms of like, is this better for us on a cost revenue model? I think they're looking at it in terms of like, this helps our customers run better infrastructure and use AWS more effectively. And long-term, I think they believe that that's better for Amazon. Azure maybe has a slightly different approach. Uh -huh. I'm Again, I'm not speaking for them. I don't know what they think, but my guess is um, Azure thinks about it a lot more in terms of um, cloud parity and competition, where Amazon released this, we're gonna release it, right? It's a tit for tat kind of game with them. Uh, that said, uh, I actually think Microsoft built the better fast product. I think their product is really solid. Mm -hmm. And um, so I don't think it was just like, we'll do it because we have to. Like, I think they really did a great job building it. But I think that there's a lot of different motivations. I just don't know if economics are the underlying motivation. Sure. Well, I was going to say that part of that, at least what, from my way I see it from the level I'm looking at like currently, you know, the, the benefit, or moving the function of this, this model has its benefits, but also you're kind of locking yourself into an individual provider yeah. with more intimate details of their service. So, I mean, I guess you, you could lift some code, for, you know, that's just a function, that's JavaScript that they're running, in, you know, sure. from, from Microsoft or uh, this. But if you're, if you're really tying into a lot of the different, you know, the, the Cloud Foundry and the, the structure and everything, right, then, then, you know, you may be getting a better benefit of cost structure, but you're also kind of locking yourself in a little bit more versus a, just a compute instance that could be a VM that you could do somewhere with the yeah, so I think the comment is um, that with these cost advantages for the customer, you also get some kind of lock-in yeah. and you, you yeah. become embedded. Um, I have a very contrarian view on this. Okay. First off, I will tell you 100% of the market agrees with you. 
except for me. <laughs> everyone, everyone says you're right. Everyone says you're right. Um, <laughs> customers talk about this a lot with us. They're worried about the lock-in. You know, there are every now and again I'll find, stumble across a blog post. Serverless means lock-in, whatever. I actually don't. I think it. I think the more abstraction you introduce, the less lock-in there are. It becomes very generic, right? I've written code that can literally run on any system. That doesn't feel like lock-in to me. Yeah. Now, what happens is the integration point, right? If I'm using AWS Lambda, my code may be very portable, right? I can just go put that on Azure Functions, right? But if I'm integrating that into a database, now all my data is in AWS, and I'm using a network, and now that network set up in AWS, you know, and you start to get to the point where you're consuming all these services, and you kind of have spider webs all through their product. That's lock-in. Yeah, that's where you probably could uh, put some design in your app, that application that, that would kind of try and insulate yourself from that somewhat, right? I mean, if you, if you so that at least at least if you're gonna lift a piece of code and you tie it to Dynamo DB, for example, if you have an abstraction layer of your own, yeah, in the code, then you can basically just have if you want to move it to Azure, then you just replace that piece of code. Yeah. So the discussion is kind of how do you manage that lock-in, I think, and doing it with architecture design. Yeah. Um, you can be really careful about that. The yeah. problem. Uh, that you create for yourself is what is called like a, a lowest common denominator problem. You can't use any feature that isn't available in every cloud because as soon as you do, you can't switch to another cloud. Which means that you can, like, you don't, you can't squeeze maybe all the functionality out of, out of any provider that you're using. Now that may be fine. You may not need their special whatever you know version of, of that implementation. Um, but it, I mean, it's a give and take. Right. Each example is going to be a trade-off that you have to make it. At, at it's a trade-off. Right? Yeah. Like the it, more generic you are, yeah. the more yeah. kind of generically you're mm -hmm. using their features. Right. Maybe Jupyter for some data the database has in their interface is okay, but some other very specialized service that Amazon offers is really valuable to go do that. Right? Yeah, and this is where I think it's important to not be overly dogmatic. Okay. I'm obviously a big fan of serverless. I think that's a cool technology. That said, there are other technologies that solve some of these problems, and it's important to kind of know what are the trade-offs between them. Containers have a lot less of the lock-in problem. If you organize, you know, if you run Kubernetes and Docker and you set up your architecture, um, you could just switch to other underlying infrastructure and run it somewhere else, right? Because you, you're not going to. There's problems with state and some other things, but in general, you're a little more. You have more control over the implementation details. But you're paid a lot of money for that, right? Like time and energy and money and skills training to get to the point where you can run that well. And so maybe that's something you consider. Any other questions? Sweet, second time here and nobody threw anything at me. Thanks. <laughs> uh, thanks very much, appreciate awesome. it. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you for coming out, we appreciate thank you. it. Yeah, it's always fun. Uh, thank you for coming. This is Academy, and we have this week's recap. So, uh, if you're interested in learning more about those tools, please give a moment to fill out the uh, survey. We also appreciate the survey because share our, your experience about today's presentation because you've got feedback to me as well. So, please take an opportunity to fill it out. And if you are interested in uh, learning more about our school, just put your info in question three and fill it in. And even the students should fill out the survey if it's possible. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.